I crammed a three-week, ah, oh, you got them. Thank you. All right. That I crammed three weeks of um, this preparation into two weeks. All right. So, because uh, we're starting first week next month um, on, on grief and loss. And uh, I wanted us to be set and ready for that when that comes up. However, I do say as well that I don't remember which month it is. I, be I believe it's April. Um, we'll be talking about financial literacy, uh, talk about handling our money. Is that a better way to understand it? And on one of those weeks, I don't remember it's third week or fourth week, um, I'm going to talk about stewardship again. Um, Brother Reggie Ivy got a really a nicely worded title for it um, somehow, but it has to do with tithing. And so uh, some of, for sure what I don't get to finish now is going to be a part of that, but some of what you might hear now is going to be a part of that um, too. So um, I thought I was going to stand up here with this coat on, but guess what? You will allow me. Forgive me for taking it off. Amen. Amen. Let's just by way of review, um, somebody catch us up because there may be somebody who was not here on last time. All right. We passed them out. Yes, sir. All right. All right. This outline uh, has got uh, much of what was talked about in outline form from last week. And then, of course, um, especially scripture reference, uh, scripture gauges for us on on tonight. Let me ask the question from some of y'all in the back, because y'all in the front now reading this. What were we, uh, how were we created and for what from last week? All right, the paper's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Answer this question, respond to this. How were we created and what for? from last week. Yes. A little bit louder. Oh, Lord. First part, yes. We were created by God in his image, yes, for his purpose. We were created by God for his purpose. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Tell me this. What is our position with God because of that? Since we were created by God and for his purpose, how do we relate to God positionally? What, what is our position? Even, I guess I can say posture. What should our posture be to God, our attitude be? Since attitude of gratitude, yes, because we recognize we were created by him and for his purpose. And so our gratitude makes us realize what? That we're responsible uh, we're to take dominion. All right. We are to take dominion. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely true. Yes, ma'am. But we're created by God and for God, which means that God has already done all of this stuff for us. God has already given all of these things to us. What is our position towards God in light of that? We're created by him and for him. To be obedient, got to obey. Yes. Do what the Lord say. We've got to obey. How about this? Because of what God has done for us, because of what God has given to us, we owe God. We owe him now. Okay, y'all not getting that. We owe him now. 
All right. Somebody gives you something. What? 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 You say thank you. But what? But what it, it used to be and I can I can see our little reluctance and hesitation here because it used to be the way we thought. We don't think a whole lot like this anymore. But anytime anybody did something to you, our graces as a people said, you got to do something now for them. Anybody remember we used to be like that? We're not like that anymore. I know. I know. But as it relates to God, we will never be out of owing God. How did the song say it? Because you can't do what? Beat God given. What? No matter how you try. The more what? And what does he do? But it doesn't mean you ain't supposed to try. We owe him. We owe, if he never gives you another dime, but you wake up the next day, guess what? You owe him. Every day that we are alive, we owe God. All right, somebody tell me this. Now, this one ain't written down. That one was on there. Y'all could have read that one. This, 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 we're just reviewing from last night. What is the relationship to discipleship? and stewardship. Big phrase, which is the key to the whole connection between discipleship last time and stewardship this time. What about it? What about it? Somebody got it. Say it. Say it. That sounds right. There it is. Discipleship is the stewardship of our salvation. I hope you all, by the way, too, ain't this a fantastic podium? I like this. I like this. I really like this. Um, by the way, you all should have been thinking about that since last week to be able to digest it in a way that you can understand it. How many of you all thought about that statement at all last week? Amen. 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 Discipleship is the stewardship of our salvation. In a word, because I don't know how clearly we actually got to understand it on last week. In a word, it's, guard, it's guardianship. Yes, we protect our salvation as stewards by making disciples of others. Yes, ma'am. The gift of salvation that God has given to us is guarded. And this is how strange it is. And you, when you realize how the scriptures work, you can see how since the kind of sense it makes in God's economy. We guard and protect our salvation, not by holding it to ourselves. <laughs> I do. Yes. Thank you. We guard and protect our salvation, not by holding it and keep it to keeping it to ourselves, but we guard it and protect it by making disciples of other. Nate, Paul says it this way. Uh, in one of the letters to Timothy, he says, um, take this that has been committed to you. He doesn't say keep it for yourself. He says, but commit it to other faithful men who will give it to others also. So that the treasure that God has given to us is to be protected and guarded, not by keeping it to ourselves. Your salvation means very, very little if you are the only one that benefits and takes advantage of it. The greatest effect of your salvation is when, in discipleship, you become a steward of your salvation. And we went through those texts um, uh, talking about the issues of stewardship. What is the primary? What is the basic? What is the first? stewardship that there is 
Not a trick question, y'all. Everybody should have been just jumping out with ants. Mumble it out one more time. God's creation as what? Yes, that's the answer. But as what? Not the trees, not the grass, not the water. The first stewardship is what? Say it again. No. So what is the first stewardship? When God created us, our first stewardship is us. It is our bodies. It is our lives. It is what we do with what God has made us because we are God's temple. And yes, ma'am, and 1 Corinthians 3 also. And that's where we actually are going to land tonight talking about our set. Well, no, that's not where we're going to talk about that a little bit more. All right. All right. All right. Let me go to this. And I struggled with whether I was going to put this as a part of um, this discussion this time on stewardship because I brought it up in our discussion on discipleship. The reason I first said that I was going to do it is because three weeks ago when I was sitting here in Bible study, two times in his lesson, Pastor Potter talked about purpose. And then Sunday in his message, after I decided before that I wasn't going to talk about it, Sunday in his message, he talked about purpose again. That said to me, the Holy Ghost in me said, I need to talk about purpose again. And so what I want to talk to us about beginning on tonight is what Dr. Miles Monroe called the seven principles of purpose. This, when I heard this the first time and when I talked about it in discipleship, this is the way I introduced it to us last time, was one of, is one of the most impactful Bible teachings I have received in my 50 years of living. And I'm about to graduate with a theology degree in May. But in all the school I ever got, with all these professors, with all these degrees, this what Miles Monroe taught on purpose, one of the most impactful Bible lessons I have ever, ever, ever received. First principle of purpose, God is a God of purpose. What does that mean to us? That everything that God does, he's got a purpose for doing it. God is not like us where we'll get up in the morning and we don't have no plan for the day. But a thought come to us, oh, I guess I'll. No, that's not how God does. Whatever God does, he has a reason for doing it and a purpose for that thing because God is a God of purpose. Number two, everything in life has a purpose. Everything in life has a purpose. That means that there is nothing that in, exists on this planet that does not have a reason for being here. God created everything with a purpose. You know what our problem is? Our problem is principle number three. Not every purpose is known. Everything has a purpose, but we don't know the purpose for everything. There are some things in this world that we look upon with disdain. There are some things that, that, that we just don't like. Who likes mice and roaches crickets. and crickets? Who likes those things? But however we feel about them, has nothing to do with the fact that God has created them as a part of his ecological system. And without those things, this world could not be what it is because God even made the critters for a purpose. And we go to stuff that we don't like and start killing it and exterminating and wiping it out. You know what's happening with honeybees right now around the world? 
Y'all heard that? About what's happening with the honeybees? That there's predicted a shortage of several different types of uh, flora and fauna because the bees who populate those things have been dying off. We don't know what else can replace it. Of course, butterflies do their type of uh, populating plants. When, when bees and butterflies land on those plants, they have on their legs and in their stingers material that attracts the pollen that are the pollinated seeds that are in these plants. And when they go land on the next one, they deposit that pollen. That's what keeps the cycle of that life going. But birds and butterflies and bees don't pollinate the same thing. And so with the bees dying off, there will be shortages of flowers and trees that we're used to. Because some beekeeper didn't know the purpose of bees. But that leads us to the fourth principle. Number one, God is a God of purpose. Number two, everything in life has a purpose. Number three, not every purpose is known. Number four, watch out. Because where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. When you don't know the purpose of a thing, you are bound to abuse it. You ever heard of spouse abuse? Child abuse? Drug abuse? Because when a man does not realize that a wife is a helper that is suitable or meet for him. When he doesn't understand that God brings a wife to a man, brings a woman and a man together for both of their lives to become what he wants them to be, then you abuse that. When you don't know that your children, according to the Bible, are the heritage of the Lord, that God is only loaning your children to you and that the purpose of parents is to teach children how to hear and obey his voice, then you will abuse them. Tell them that they can grow up to be whatever they want to be. I don't want to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this. That's the most foolish thing you can tell your child, that they can grow up to be whatever they want to be. Especially when you see that there has been a black president and you can say to them now, you can be it too. It's foolish. And talk to me later and I'll tell you why it's foolish. But the purpose of children is not for them to feel the desires in their heart. The purpose of Children, it's for you to show them how to go to God to find out what he wants them to be. Why? Because God is a God of purpose. And if God made people, God's got a purpose for that child. It's about what he wants the child to be. But if you don't know the purpose of children so you can love them, so you can have a friend. What? When you don't know the purpose of the child, then you will abuse your own children. That leads us to the next, next one, number five. Number five is, and this is where we really get messed up at. This is where most of us are, which is you can't ask the thing what its purpose is. Ooh, y'all got quiet. You cannot ask the thing its purpose. The thing, whatever it is, the person, the thing. All right, what am I saying? No, this looks better than that. Oh, beautiful new podium. With this aluminum and formica covering on you. What is your purpose? 
Maybe I should talk to the front of it. Since it's faith. What is your purpose, podium? Maybe the chair can help me. Chair! With this beautiful burgundy fabric covering. Can you tell me what is your purpose? Y'all talk. Let me ask you. <laughs> what is your purpose? And this is not rhetoric. I'm really asking. You want the mic? Come get it. What is your purpose? You cannot ask the thing its purpose. Why? I ask you. I don't think you can ask an inanimate thing what the purpose is, but you can have in your head what you think that that purpose would. Because I, you know, as I can surely tell, that chair is for sitting down, and that podium is for. And know. how do we know? Let me have this back. Okay. How do we know that the purpose of this chair is for sitting down? Because we've experienced it. We've been experienced. We've been taught it. All right. What's the other purpose of the chair? It could be for standing. Okay. How do we know, though, what the chair is for? It's not because what we've done with it. We've learned that. That's a learned experience. Because the person who made it tells what they make it for. And the reason you can't ask each other what your purpose is, because just like the sister says, we may think in our mind what we know our purpose is, but God is the only one who knows our purpose. He made us. And so we're walking around empty, cynical, frustrated, and confused after two years, 10 years, 25, 40 years of being saved and don't even know what we're saved for. Don't even know what we're supposed to be doing with our lives. Don't even know what we're supposed to be doing with our bodies. Don't even know what we're supposed to be doing with our money. Because we think that what we think we should be doing is what we should be doing. That's why you've got to understand that the first stewardship is not what I give, it's what I am. Because it is about God's purpose. It's not about our pleasure. It's not about our happiness. It's not about what we want out of life. It is about what God wants out of us. And because God is a God of purpose, he gets to decide that everything has a purpose. He realizes that you don't know the purpose. Not every purpose is known. How does he know it? Because we keep on abusing stuff because we don't know the purpose. And when we find out we don't know the purpose, we walk around asking other people who don't even know their purpose. But just like Brother Sori says, we don't sit in this chair because that's what we always been, we've been doing. We sit in it because whoever made the first chair <laughs> made it for the purpose of sitting in in the very same way. Number six, purpose is only in the mind of the creator. If you want to know what your life is for, and I talked about this in discipleship, if you want to know what you're supposed to be about, young man, the God who made you is the only one who has that answer. He uses pastors to tell us sometimes. 
when we listen, <laughs> I thought I'd slide that in there. But you've got to be in a connection with God in a way that he reveals his purpose to you. I dare you to read Amos 3, 7 when you get home. I'm going to tell you what Amos 3, 3 says first, because you need to know that too. It says, how can two walk together unless they agree or can two walk together unless they agree? The two that Amos is talking about in that text, you can put you and God as the two. And I asked you the question then, can you and God walk together unless you agree? How does that relate to purpose? Because the only thing that God wants to talk about you talk about with you first is what he wants you to do. All these other conversations that you have, God, give me, lend me. Can I, can I borrow? Can I have? Bless me. God ain't listening to that mess. Th them capital letters, capital M, capital E, capital S, S. Mess. He ain't listening to that. Because God knows and our records are 100% perfect every time that whatever God gives to us, we use it for ourselves. Our records are perfect on that. Rescue me if I'm wrong, y'all. Tell me to shut up if I'm lying. And so God doesn't want to talk to us about giving us anything. Well, let me tell you how good he is as a God anyway. That's not the conversation he wants to have, but guess what he does? He's doing it all the time anyway. But if you're going to agree with God and walk with God, God wants to talk about what you're doing with your life. God wants to talk about how in line what you're doing is with what he's created you for. Purpose is only in the mind of the maker. And as good as your favorite TV preacher is. Oh, I know I'm in the right room. How many times he ever met you or she? How in the world can they know anything about your life? And I watch them, too. Because I have to know what y'all watching. How do they know what your life is supposed to be about? They don't even know what color your hair is or was. I'm just saying. But the ones that God sits in our midst, in our midst to help us figure out the maze of this life, we don't even give the time of our listen. Let me tell you how critical that is. Because most of us don't have the kind of relationship with God that we're supposed to have where God can reveal our purpose to us. God calls our pastors and uses them to be the ones to help us with our purpose. Let me back up and say it again. I started right here because most of us don't have the kind of relationship with God we are supposed to have so he can reveal our purpose to us. He calls our pastors to help us figure out what that purpose is. That right there ought to change your whole relationship with church from now on. Because then you understand it's not coming singing in the choir. That's not what you come to church for. I told you I got to cramp three weeks into this, 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 these two weeks. I got to go for it. That's why coming to church ain't about you presidenting and chairman and your committee or auxiliary. Do that stuff now. Do it. But that's not why you come here. We come here because we need a word from the Lord. Can I get a witness anywhere in here? Because our lives are so encumbered with so much other stuff, even in our personal time, God's got too much stuff to break through to get to us. So we come into this place to lift his name up so that his presence come down, comes down so that the word of God may be living and active among us. 
That's what you're supposed to be coming here for. You know what that is? That's stewardship of church. How about that? You see what I just did? Your time here is a stewardship time. If you come to church for the wrong thing, you're missing what God has for you. That's church stewardship. That ain't even on my notes nowhere. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Let me move on because y'all not liking this purpose. It's only in the mind of the maker of the thing. Why am I telling you this, sisters and brothers? Because, because, because. I could add that too, because of the wonderful things he does. But I'm telling us that because we have got to get way more serious about our relationship with God than we are right now. It's a tragedy, this is Miles Monroe, for you to have lived your whole entire life and never known what God created you for. Miles Monroe says that the richest place on the planet is not the diamond mines in Zimbabwe. I've been there, I've seen them myself. Not the gold mines in South Africa. Gold so deep down in the ground, there's no technology that can even dig far enough to get that stuff out the ground. Miles says that that's not the richest place in the earth. Miles says, you know what the richest place in the earth is? It's the cemetery. The cemetery. Why cemetery? He says, because in that place is buried all of the potential that God put in men and women that they not only never tapped into, they never knew that it was there. How do you measure against that? We talking about stewardship. So that if at this point in your life you do not know what your purpose is, you know you're actually a liability to the kingdom of God rather than an asset. You look at what's all going wrong in the world. You look at all what's going wrong in the church. How do you know that the purpose God made you for was to solve that one issue? To make the world better. Is there any way that you can tell that the gift that he's given to you is the one that would turn the church around? You don't even know. And I got to be rough with you. I got to prod you. Why? Because we've been too long not knowing. You're wasting time, sisters and brothers. You are wasting your life, sisters and brothers. You are wasting God's purpose because you don't even know what it is. Cure for cancer could be in this very room right now. How do you know? The cure for AIDS and all the other debilitating diseases that, that the world is plagued with, how do you know that it's, you don't have to be a doctor to figure it out. A whole lot of people that are not in the field of whatever discoveries they made didn't even know nothing about that stuff. How do you know that it's not you that God uses to cure world hunger? Purpose is only in the mind of the maker. And so I'm pushing us in this direction. I'm pushing hard because the relationship that we have had, watch this, with ourselves has not led us where we need to be with God. The relationship that we've had with our church has not led us to where we're supposed to be with God. So I'm pushing us hard tonight. I'm prodding us tonight because we have got to change what our relationship with God is.
You know the only thing that can make you free? Not a trick question. It's in the Bible. Jesus said it. Red letters. You know the only thing that can make you free? No. Not the truth. No. That's not what it says. It doesn't say the truth make you free. Yeah, I see y'all balling your faces up. I ain't scared of that. That's not what the Bible says. What does it say? Mumble it out. What does it say? You shall what? Know the truth and what? The truth by itself cannot free you. You, you say it, gotta know it. It's the truth that you know that makes you free. There's truth all around you everywhere. How has your life changed? It has not. It is when you have the relationship with the truth, knowing it, that you become free. But I misspoke then, too, because I call the truth it. Tell me what's wrong with that. What's wrong with that? Say it out loud. The truth is not a teaching or a doctrine. The truth is not some philosophical construct. The truth is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. I know I'm on good ground because Jesus said it. I am the way. Jesus talking, red letters. I am what? The truth. What is our issue with being caught in this thing of not understanding who we are? We read the Bible, some of us sometimes. We listen to all this religious stuff. We even holler back at Rev when he up here preaching. I sat in the back for the past three Sundays to watch y'all and listen to y'all. So y'all talk back to him. Of course, I'd be hollering out too back there, but I'm just saying. But how much of that experience has gone beyond our auditory observance, that means just hearing it, and gone into doing something? Because you know what the issue with the Bible is? The issue with the Bible is that we not be hearers only. Do you ever read that text? But you've got to take what you've heard and put it into practice. That's knowing the truth. You can't really know something if you've just seen it and have not done anything with it. Somebody cooked the most beautiful... Oh, my God. Play the food you have seen in your life. And they can tell you how wonderful, fantastic, delicious and good it is. But how will you know if it's really good? Oh, taste and see. Here's the issue with purpose. Purpose is only in the mind of the maker of a thing. That means only God can help you to understand your purpose, reveal your purpose to you. I want to suggest to you, in fact, I've already said it to you tonight, that God places us in places, in situations to help us to come to understand our purpose. I got to submit to you. I don't know what the address is, but I know this is Antioch Baptist Church. For right now, this time in your life, guess where your station for understanding your purpose is? So say it again. Five. What, what they said. No, not what she said. What's the right address? <laughs> this is the station. This is the station for you to come to understand your purpose. Last principle, number seven, 
is that purpose is the key to fulfillment. Let me say this very simply because I have to move very quickly. That in terms of having, I'm sorry, in terms of having peace in your life, In terms of having a true joy in your life. In terms of being able to live where the circumstances around you does not determine your quality of life. Understanding and fulfilling your purpose is the only way to do that. Purpose is the key to fulfillment. Let me say it another way. We all have a goal for what we want to do with our lives. We all have five-year goal, 10-year, long-term goal, short-term goal. We all have a a number in terms of retirement that we have. We we all have a number in terms of salary that we want to earn. We all have an amount in the bank that if I had this much, I'd be all right. What I'm telling you, sisters and brothers, that there are people in this world who have more money, listen, than you can see. And don't have a lick of peace. Have all the things that life can afford because they can afford them, but they can't even sleep. And so what we spend our lives trying to do is to be happy in life. Seventh principle says this, that if you understand God's purpose for your life and you are about fulfilling it, your life will be fulfilled right there. And I got to say this as I'm going to this next part. However, you know, when people say however like that, it usually ain't good on the other side of that, right? Fulfillment should not be the goal of our lives in the first place. Why, preacher? I'm going to tell you quickly. Because our life should have a very different focus and goal. Our lives, for whatever time God gives us, as he teaches us to number our days, our lives are supposed to be about faithfulness to God. How old are you? How old do you plan to be? Say you live 78 years. Anybody in here older than 78? Say you live 88 years. Anybody in here over 88? Say you live 288 years. Anybody in here older than that? Whatever amount of life you have, that's the time that you have to be faithful. But here comes fulfillment. All the rest of eternity is what God gives us to be fulfilled. And so our life then is about the stewardship of Caring for what God has given to us. There are some songs that we sing that typify this whole idea of stewardship. I woke up uh, three, four days ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. This song, I ain't heard it in in so long. All of a sudden, this song comes up in my heart. I'm yours, Lord. Y'all know it. Everything I am. What else? Everything I'm not. Everything I have, everything I got, I'm yours, Lord. What's the next part? Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. That's a stewardship song. The song recognizes that of all of what my life consists of, it all comes from God. And because God has given this to me, we sing this stuff all of our lives. Because God has given this to me, I've got to give myself back to him. I'm yours. Where do we get tangled up at? We think God is more interested in stuff. You know how much God think about gold? 
God has such a high opinion of gold, we understand that the streets of the kingdom are paved with it. It's for where your feet go. You know how much God thinks about pearls and the finest stones and, 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 and uh, all of those glittery things that we love? It means so much to God. The gates of his city is made out of that stuff. But you want to know what God's most valuable real estate is? On the count of three, everybody say your name out loud. One, two, three. That's what means something to God. And so what you give, okay, all right. But when you give you, God gets excited. I'm yours, Lord. What's another song that we sang from long ago? It, it, it's a song that talks about our stewardship. You remember the old hymn? What does it say? What else? A never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Here it is. To serve this present age. That's faithfulness. My calling to fulfill. May it all my power engage to do what? Your will? My will? Whose will? That's a stewardship song. How many times you ever sang that song? Oh, y'all ain't going to own up to it? When you sing a song like that, you're telling God that he can do whatever he wants to with your life because you recognize as a steward of this that you're giving it back to him. Pastor, uh, three weeks ago, same time, he, he, he did this song. They had sang it in church the previous Sunday, but he asked for the words of it Milton Brunson, Thompson Community Singers out of Chicago. Lord, I'm available to you. You know that song? This is the part. It says, you gave me my hands. To do what? To reach out to man. To show them your purpose and your perfect plan. You gave me my ears so I can hear the cries of sinner. But I can't wipe away their tears. He goes on talking about, you gave me all of these things. And so what? When I recognize that this is what you have given to me, what does he say? I'm now giving back to you all the things you gave to me. My hands, my ears, my voice, my heart. You can use them as you please. Here's the part. Now I am emptying out my cup. That's what you think your life's supposed to be. That's what your desire for yourself is supposed to be. That's what all of the stuff that you want out of life. The song says, I'm emptying out my cup so that what? So that you can fill me up. Listen to this last part. Now I'm free. You're supposed to have made the connection with me talking about knowing the truth a moment ago. When I say now I'm free, your mind was supposed to go back. Oh, you just talked about being free just a minute ago. You're supposed to connect that with that. So I know I'm slow sometimes too. I need reminders. <laughs> now I'm free. This is the song. And I just want to be more, say it says, available to you. And then he said, Lord. I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way. Is that discipleship in there? Yeah. To enable me to say, my storage is empty. When I'm trying to fulfill my own will, my storage is empty. As I'm out here hustling on this job so that I can get ahead with what I, my storage is empty. Now that I'm brought all of this stuff and I got tagged on these clothes in the closet that I ain't worn in eight years. My storage is empty. And now I'm available to you. We sing this stuff and don't even understand that we are talking about stewardship of our very own lives. Here comes the next part. I got to run through this quickly. 
They're true demonstrations of stewardship. We see the first one in 2 Corinthians um, 8 chapter, 1 through 5 verses. Hurry up, read that, please. Somebody get Luke 15 chapter. And I can't, I'll just skim through Luke, but I, you got to see 1 Corinthians 8. Please, hurry, quickly. 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, yes. Keep going. Yes. Why bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were are freely willing and pouring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry of the saints, and not only as we have hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. What's the stewardship verse in there? What's the what's the part about stewardship in there? You just heard you just read. You're all reading it. I'm looking at you. you read. Which one? Ha! You got it. You got it. But, but, but let me set the story up. I can't tell it all. I, re I really wanted to talk about the details. I can't, can't do the details. Let me tell you what's happening. Paul wanted to take an offering to help the sister church. In the church at Macedonia, they had been afflicted with some kind of issue. Ellicott and Barnes, the commentaries, they don't know. None of the commentators can tell what the affliction issue was. However, Along with whatever affliction that had happened to the church at Macedonia, there was also great poverty at the church. They didn't have money and somehow or other they were messed up. But Paul says that their joy mixed with the affliction and the poverty is in your book. I'm not making this up. Out of their poverty and affliction, joy caused them to do something Paul had never seen done in all of the churches. Paul says they did more than we even expected. It was enough if they had sent a letter and said, we really would like to give. We understand the need. We are completely unable to help at this time. That would have been fine, because guess what? Their condition was just like that. But Paul said, no, that's not how they did. Paul says they did not only, out of their affliction and poverty, send us some money too. Do you see? They didn't have it, and they were messed up, but they found it, and they gave it Still. But Paul says it was even bigger than that. Paul says before they gave anything to us, they gave themselves to God. Oh, my God. Y'all supposed to get that. Here's a simple principle. Whatever you give yourself to God for first, he can always do more than everybody else put together can do. Y'all not getting it. If when you hear what the need is, before you decide this is what I'm going to do, if when you hear what the need is, you say, Lord, I'm available to you. You have no idea how much God is able to take what you have. Let, let me tell you how important it is, sisters and brothers. More than 2,000 and 19 years later, I'm telling you about the Macedonian church because of how they gave themselves to God and then to Paul. That's a demonstration of stewardship. That's why most of us, I said most of us, so I ain't doing this, I'm doing this. That's why most of us don't tithe right yeah, I said it. 
talk about stewardship. You think I ain't going to say money? That's what most of us ain't tithed right in all the years we've been saved. And I'm coming to it. I'm coming back. Don't think I'm done. Luke 15 chapter. What you find there is a cluster of parables. Uh, three of more, the more common parables that we know about is the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Prodigal son, we call it. Very, very insightful cluster that I think most of the time we miss what's going on. And I don't have time to break it down. Let me just suggest to you that the purpose of the parables, there's only one purpose for all three. That's why they're clustered together, because Jesus is conveying one point. He's using three different stories to convey that one point. It's not found at the end of the story of the lost <clears throat> sheep, coin, or son. It's found in the question that is asked of the Pharisees. Here's the point of all three of the parables, and then I'm going to tell you how it has to do. Never mind. I'll come back to that. The point of the parable is the attitude that we should have when the lost come into the fold of God. All right. I'm, I didn't list any verses there because your homework is to go home and read the whole chapter. And I'm telling you now, the answer to the parable is in the question that is asked. And then you see the response after the sheep is found, after the coin is found, after the sun is found. OK, but watch this. In this parable that God, Jesus is teaching about how we ought to receive those who have come back, he uses stewardship parables. You don't see stewardship. The man has 100 sheep. He's a shepherd. Or better one if you're in the Near East. What is the responsibility of a shepherd? Tend them, guard them, protect them. How about this word? Keep them. What happened? He lost one. What does that mean? His stewardship is now affected. If he didn't understand the purpose of a shepherd, he would say, well, I got 99. I'm still good. I only lost one. But because he understands the purpose of a shepherd, whatever he starts with, he knows he's got to finish with that. So what does he do? He goes after the minority and leaves the majority so that they all can be one again. It's stewardship. The woman has 10 coins. Money, 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 money. And I know y'all can relate to that one. You lose that $50 bill. You lose that check you ain't cashed yet. <laughs> Turning up everything, tearing down everything, right? You can relate to her, right? She got nine other coins. But that nine is not a set without the one. And what does she do? The house is already clean. She tears it up and cleans it again to make sure that what she started with is what she ends up with. It's stewardship. And then there's the son. This man realizes, I don't have time. This man realizes that his responsibility as a parent is to make sure that when they are old, they will not depart. What, what's the first part of that? Train up a child, right? He did what he was supposed to do. He did that. But there is a place at which there are some other ways that comes in conflict. 
And what does this son do? I, 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 there's, a, there's so many details that are intricate to this story. You, you would cry real tears to understand what it means when this boy goes to his daddy and say, give me what's supposed to be mine. If he was Harold David Copeland, that's my daddy. After I got the worst cussing that I'd ever received before, I would have needed help getting myself up off the floor. You got to follow this, though, because this father understands the purpose of parents, that when you train them up the way that they should go, watch what he does. Kicking in the face of every custom of Hebrew culture, when the younger son says, give me my inheritance, the father gives it to him. What does the son do? He does what young sons do. He wilded it out with it. He acted a fool with it. He blew it. He got lit and turned up. I thought I'd come down your street. And the money was gone. Don't take long. It sure don't take long. Woo! But because his father understood that when you train up a child the way that they should go, look what his son does when he's got nothing left. He says, I have a father. Y'all read this now. I'm not making it. says Luke 15. And he says, I am going back to my father. And it's not what the father, not what the son did that makes him remember his father. Because if, if, if the son remembered and regarded his father, he wouldn't have left in the first place. But when his father, above training him the way that he should, he then gives him what he should not have. The son remembers his father. Where's the stewardship? Let me show you right now. In the distance, there is a figure. From where he sits, the father sees it. At a point, he recognizes that the figure is not a sheep out there. It ain't the bush blowing in the wind. It is his son that he sees in the distance. And every implication of the text suggests that as the father sees him afar off there is because that's what the father did all the time, which is sit there and watch for his lost son. And when he's sure in the distance that that's who it is, what does the Bible say? He took off. He took off, headed for. I, I don't even have time to tell you all of this stuff, but everything about the culture says that an old man never runs. There's several reasons for it. One is because of the respect of his age. There's nothing that that happens around that should get him out of his position of comfort. The second thing is because of the way they are dressed, they wear all of these long robes and things. So in order for him to run, he's got to grab up all of this stuff and take up. The old man runs to his son that has dishonored him. But what does he say? This was my son. <laughs> he was 
dead, but he's now alive. He was lost, but he is now found. Brothers and sisters, the father's attitude shows us stewardship. I got to tell you that because too many times your children have run afoul of what you have taught them and what you have told them and how you have trained them and you've turned them out. You have given them up and let them go. And when they, like this boy, realized that he had a home and a father to go back to, when they tried to come back home, you didn't let them come back home. And so I'm trying to tell you that when it comes to stewardship, as a parent, what your job as a parent is to train them to hear and obey God's voice. What does that mean? I'm way in your business, but I'm jumping down because I actually got family on here in this. I, I call it something else. I call it tribe. But 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 that when it comes to your children, you've got to be a steward of your family. I'm a rush on. I'm a rush on. I'm a rush on. Last one is this parable of the talents. Twenty five. Uh, Matthew 14 to 30. I'm not going I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to tell you what's happening there. You know this well because this is what everybody goes to to talk about stewardship. This master comes and he has three servants. He gives one 10, five and another uh, one 10, one 2 and one one talent. First thing I need to let you know is uh <laughs> if we would calculate one talent in today's amount uh, 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 the amount of money that it is today, $1,400,000. One talent. One talent. That's what he gave to one. He gave the other one two. You can count that up. Uh, 2800000 right? He gave the other one how many? <laughs> I ain't messing with y'all. I'm about to quit. But he, give, he gives the one servant one talent. Equivalent of one million four hundred thousand dollars today, all right. So, so, so we look at that. I've heard him talk about it too. Well, he only gave him one. What? <laughs> Where's your one talent? <laughs> and so, let, let let me just say it this way: If you gave somebody one hundred, I mean one million four hundred thousand dollars, and expected something good out of it. Can't you understand how that master felt? Here is very quickly, somebody get that, because there's one line in there that helps us to see that the stewardship is not so much the, he hid the money and didn't turn it over. Somebody get it, Matthew 25, 14, 14 to 30. If I can get it before y'all, there's something wrong. And I got it right now. For the kingdom of God is like a man traveling to a far country when he called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five, another two, another one. Sixteen, then he who had received the five talents went and traded. You know that, right? Likewise, seventeen, he who had... Receive to gain more also. You know that, right? But, and that's what we need to do, get the butts out the way. Oh, y'all ain't get that. He who had received one went and dug it in, in the ground. Now, I understand dug it and put it in the ground. How he dug it in the ground, I'm not quite sure on that one. That's what I said. He dug in the ground. Thank you, Doc. After a long time, the Lord comes back. So he who had received five talents, you know what he did, right? 21, his Lord said to him, what? Good and faithful servant, what? You were faithful. Jump down to verse 23. His Lord said to him, what? Well done. Say it out loud. Good. What happened? You what? 
Sisters and brothers. Sisters and brothers. This life is all we have of our stewardship to be faithful to God. He says two times to each of the five and the two talent servants, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful. You know the easy lesson. It's not about what you have. You already know that one. That's not what I'm talking about. Stewardship is the proof of faithfulness. Stewardship is the proof of faithfulness. Now, we've erred because we've allowed a certain part of the body of Christ to popularize this teaching on faith that missed the mark of what faith is about. What they have been teaching us is that faith is to get stuff from God. When what this parable teaches us is that faith is for using what God gives us for what He wants to be done. Faith is not to get more. Faith is to use what you already have. How does it work? Because what you have is really not enough for what God has planted it in your heart to do. Pastor could testify on this. When it came, I'm sure, to the, to, to the idea of building where we in right now and even what the second part that we got, our faith, the, the, the idea of what we have is way bigger than the resources that we have to start to do it with. This master is impressed because he didn't give them any direction on what to do. He didn't tell them, here's this, I need you to go do this, that, and the other, because that's what most of us need. You know who really need that? I'm the one who need that. You got to tell me. Line by line, every detail. You got to explain it to me. What do you want me to do? He didn't tell them what he wanted them to do, but they knew what kind of man he was. That's what the, the last servant says. I knew what kind of master you were. They knew who, how he was, too. And they took what he had and did what he would be pleased with. That's what God is expecting out of you and me, sisters and brothers. When we understand our purpose and what God intends for us, What does he say to Moses? We 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 in front of this sea, we got an army behind us, mountains on the side. What did God say? What's in your hand? God said, what are you coming to me for? (laughs) Why? Because what's in your hand is what you use before to help you out of the situation. How does that relate to us? You already know what God has done in your life, sisters and brothers. What is stewardship? Because you recognize that he has already given you the victory. Whatever he has purposed in your heart to do, you move out in faith to do it because the same God who did it before, he'll do it again. Good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. I'm trying to finish in time to have questions. That's what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm going to do. There are other areas of stewardship. I've literally printed those out. I have printed the scriptures for those issues. There is stewardship. First of all, the first stewardship is what? Stewardship of what? No, 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 no. (laughs) The first stewardship is ourself, right? The next stewardship, the other areas of stewardship is with our tongue. Let me tell you 
brothers and sisters like Annie Pearl Williams, that's my mama, would tell me, boy, you talk too much. And you know what's wrong with most Christians? Don't be ashamed to say it. We talk too much about the wrong things. We got something to say about everything, but about what our purpose is. Come on, talk to me now. And so our tongue is an area of stewardship. And Pastor, two weeks ago, was on the tongue. And that text is in here too. So if you like Old Testament, New Testament, guess what I did for you? I put both of them in there. And you got to read them all. Here's the issue with our tongue. And you'll hear the psalmist say this. James will say it this way first. Let me say what James says. With our tongue, we bless God and curse men. And then he asks the question, how should these things be? How in the world can we do that? The psalmist will say it this way. Keep a guard at my tongue. You know God will shut your mouth, don't you? All right. So, so those texts are in there. I, I really want to go through some of them. I don't have time to do it. There's another stewardship. There's stewardship of our time. I will suggest to us that this is one of the more imperative issues that we've got to give our attention to, our stewardship of our time, because our days on this earth are numbered. That's one thing. But watch this. Watch this. Some of the things that God has given us to do, he's only given us a certain time in which to do those things so that you may live to be 80 years old. But there's something God expected you to do at 35. And if you have not done it, do you know when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you've got to give an account for that. Let me go back right quick to the tongue. You know what else is true? The Bible says this way, every idle word, all this extra talking we be doing, we've got to give an account for that. We're going to have to say to God, why did you say that? <laughs> You're going to have to tell him. I posted on Facebook, uh, this is four, maybe five weeks ago, the re realization I came on my own about myself. I, th there's a way in which I feel like sometimes I have to explain stuff to people. Beyond just the regular, because people don't understand. Because people don't understand. But I feel like I have to explain myself. And what I realize is, and the Holy Ghost said it to me, Darren, you talk too much. This is how I posted on Facebook. Darren, you talk. No, Darren, stop talking so much. You don't have to explain everything. That was, and I said it this way, me to me. It was my own message to me because I realized after being saved, how many years I've been saved? 38 years? 1977, count that up. After all these years of being saved, I still ain't got control of my tongue. Preaching 30 years, still ain't got control of my tongue. I don't mind being self-disclosing. You know why? Because people have this idea about preachers that we're perfect. My testimony, I'm perfectly messed up. And so I talk about what are my faults and frailties and foibles and, 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 and things so that Hopefully you can identify and see somewhere, well, if, if that preacher say that's what's wrong to him and this is what you got to see, that he's still striving to be right with God so that you can see for yourself. I'm messed up, but I got to be striving to be right with God still. It's tongue, it's time. Why else is time so critical? Not be, just because there is so little of it left, but because... Woo. You've heard this saying before that time is money. How's that relate to this? Most studies have shown that there is a direct correlation with the way people treat their time and the way they treat their money. That people who are really good at managing their time, that take care of their time, who don't waste time, 
take care of their money. They manage their money well. They don't waste money. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. And so time is important because it relates to other critical issues in our life. There then, of course, is the issue of our talent. What are you able to do in the service of the Lord? And I lump into this both talents and gifts. The scriptures that you'll read in there talk about our talents and our gifts. There's a very distinctive difference between our talents and our gifts. Our talents, not talking about <clears throat> the money that the master gave to the servants, talent in a monetary sense. I'm talking about talent in the, listen, natural abilities that we have that we cultivate. You're an artist. You practice your art. You're a singer. You practice, you practice your singing. You're an athlete. You practice your sport. And so there are natural abilities that we have that we cultivate or there's stuff that we don't have at all. But we learn how to do those things. That is our talent. There is a stewardship of those things that we are able to do that blesses the kingdom of no contributes to the kingdom of God and blesses the lives of other people. We have to be stewards of those things, those talents, those abilities that are in our lives. Here's the step up. Then there are the gifts. God uniquely has given every one of us at least one gift. Say it another way, preacher, so we can understand you. Everybody in the world has at least one gift given by God. What is the stewardship of that? Especially because God has given it to you, you have to be a steward of that. Difference between gift and talent, talent is natural. Do you understand that? It's got nothing to do with God. The gift is spiritual. God gives it to you. But guess which one you got to be a steward of? Both of them. Both of them. And so in our ability, God is looking for the ways that we can contribute to the kingdom of God and the way we can help the lives of other people. And in terms of our gift, the uh, fourth chapter of, first, of, of Ephesians is very clear about how God and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4, those are in there. Both are very explicit about the gifts that God gives us and the way that they are supposed to <clears throat> Help the whole body of Christ become who we are supposed to be. Did you know that's how serious your gift is? It's not just something that you have, but whatever that gift is, and, and both Ephesians and 1 Corinthians tells us this, that whatever your part is contributes to the whole thing that God has made the body of Christ to be. So that if your gift is not given, everybody is lacking when you don't do what you're supposed to do. As well as pastor preaches and administrates, if you don't do your part, Antioch ain't what it's supposed to be. And neither is the worldwide body of Christ. How does Paul say it? Because every joint and ligament supplies to the function of the way God wants the body to work. How does he make it clear? He says the ear cannot say to the whatever part of the body. In other words, a smaller part of the body is not any less important than a larger part because it takes every part working together for all of us to be what God wants us to be. Your talent, your gift. I'm moving fast. Your thoughts. Oh, yeah, I'm hitting you in the head right now. There's supposed to be a stewardship of our thoughts. There's one verse in here. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, I think it is, 10, 10, 10, 8. Listen to what it says. King James Version, the way I like it the most, it says that, that we have to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What does that mean? That you have the ability to take control of the thoughts in your mind. Why is that true? Because Paul explains in another place, we have the mind of Christ. Once you are saved, we have the mind of Christ. And so when thoughts come in our minds, you're not worth it. You are no good. You ought to kill yourself. Oh, I know. 
I know. The Bible says that you can cast down those thoughts and bring them obedient to Christ because they're not from him. I'm moving on. Then there's your temple, your body. You already know that your body is a temple of the living God. Let me, let me do this right quick, and I'm, I'm stopping. Uh, we can ask three questions. The thing said 815, Pastor. Can we, do we have any time for questions? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Temple, watch this. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Y'all say he got that board out today. He ain't even used it. Watch me use it. This is a representation of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This area, who knows the name of that area? Huh? Nope. This place. Take a guess. Hurry up. This is the outer court. CT. Inner court or what else? What else is it called? You said it, Reverend. It is the holy place. PL, place. What is that? This place. Say it loud. It is the holy of holies. HH. Or most holy place. Let me show you what Dr. A.R. Bernard, Christian Cultural Center of Brooklyn, New York, who I don't remember how many years ago, how he explained this. What happens in this place is where the people actually can enter into because just at the right there, they're selling the animals for the sacrifice. The sacrifice that is to be made uh, so that the sins of the people and the other things um, are, are given by God. There's furniture that's outside. There's a brazen labor. There's furniture in here. There's furniture in each part of this. Don't have time for that. When you come to this place, this is where the priests actually are. And so only those of the tribe of Levi, uh, Levi can enter into this place. Not everybody can. Only the priests come into this place. In this place is where what is called the mercy seat. The mercy seat, um, two foot by two foot, wooden box overlaid with gold, with a solid gold top, with two cherubim on each side, with their wings stretched toward each other. In the space between the cherubim's wings, is where the presence of God comes to earth to receive the sacrifice and expiate the sin of man. That space between where these angels' wings are. Only one person, one time of year, the Day of Atonement, is able to enter into this place. That's where the presence of God is. Let me tell you how serious it is. Because the man who goes in there, his life has got to be so clean. He's got to have fasted. He's got to bathe himself. He's got to have not just clean clothes. He's got to have new clothes on to actually go in there. But as far as the people can see, he can have on new clothes. He can have on clean And he's fine. But man looks at the outer appearance. What does God look at? So because people don't know what's going on in his heart, in order for him to enter into this place, they tie a rope around his ankle. There are pomegranates and there are bells on this rope. As he is moving up through this temple into this holy place, every step he takes, they can hear the bell jingle. Every move he makes, they hear the bell jingle. When he gets into that holy place where nobody else can see, all there is is the sound. 
If the sound is being made, everybody knows that he's all right before God. But if there's anything in his heart, he falls dead on the floor. And when they don't hear the bell ring anymore, they have to pull him out of there. Because this is the place where God is. All of this is the temple of God. But this is the place where God comes to dwell. When Paul says that your body and my body is this, there is stuff that goes on in this part of our lives. Romans chapter 1 says God winks at it. He closes his eyes. He, he, he doesn't not know what's going on. But he doesn't judge you right now for that. And then we move up into this area. God wants to be in the whole place. But because where sin is, God is not. And where God is, sin is not. Did I say that right? You come up in this area. We're a little bit better at this part. But God is desiring to get to this place in our life. God wants to be at the control center of our life, because if God is in this place in our lives, all of these other places will come in line with what God expects out of us. And so when it comes to stewardship, there never has to be a question of what we're going to do with God, what he's given to us. Because when he is in this place in our lives and we are right in our hearts with him, all the rest of the temple is a place where God can use us. So when it comes to tithing, this is how tithing works. We come full circle. We come full circle. Because the original economy of tithing has nothing to do with money. What happens? When a baby is born, God has asked that when the children are born, they have to come to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. What kind of children that he wants? He, wants, he loves all the children. But when you bring the baby, the baby should be whole. How do you know the baby is whole? Well, you look down at his feet. And you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you look at his hands. And you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten fingers, ten toes. It's a whole baby. Bring the child to the Lord. And so the understanding of giving back to God what belongs to him is the representation that the whole ten digits has to come back to God. What does that mean in terms of tithing? Tithing is the starting point with the ten part. Why? Because 10 represents a whole. How much of it belongs to God? All of it does. But we understand that this is what God is pleased with because of the representation. What happens when we begin to understand the purpose of the tithe? Talking about purpose, right? Everything in life has a purpose. Tithing has a purpose. The tenth part is the starting place. So that as your faith in God grows and your trust in God grows and your reliance upon God grows, what you bring to God should increase. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, corrections, contributions. How 
How does forgiveness affect our ability? Accountability. Hmm. How, how do you mean? Because of us or because of God? Oh, 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 oh. Bible is very clear. If you say you have no sin, you a liar. You make God a liar. That's very clear. But what does he say elsewise? You got to confess your sin. You got to confess it. Because uh, Psalm 66, if I regard iniquity in my heart, unforgiveness, God will not even hear me. And so if I have what I know to be sin there, if there's unforgiveness, there are things that I have not confessed to God. If that's there and I know it's there, God won't even hear me. Uh, the question last week, so what is stewardship? Somebody asked that question last week. What is stewardship? I want to ask y'all from out of what well, we talked about, what do, you, what do you get stewardship? Stewardship, very simply, responsibly handling what God gives to us. Responsibly handling what God gives to us. Any other questions? All right, y'all email me, call me, and ask me these questions. Yes. Me too. <laughs> to be disciples? Yes. And no, 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 I'm sorry, no. Everybody's responsibility is discipleship, not everybody's purpose. We, once we're saved, we're responsible to make uh, disciples. That's Matthew 28. Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So we're responsible to do that. That responsibility may have nothing to do with the purpose God has given for your life. The purpose can be something altogether different. The responsibility... And this is a good question. Let me tell you why. Because many times people f discover their purpose while they're doing the responsibility. When you're doing what you do know you're supposed to be doing, then the understanding of, excuse me, the understanding of what God has created you for, that comes to people many times that way. So do what you know to do and seek God for what you're here for. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Don't feel rushed. Stop me later. Call me, email me, Facebook me, and ask whatever you want to know. Huh? Who is what? The high priest. This is the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. The high priest is the only one who goes in there. That's where the Ark of the, the Covenant is. Yes. Yes. Yeah, all of these are Levites. All the priests are Levites. Yes. Yes. Uh, Kohane is their name. Um, well, I won't even go too far. Now. Yes, they're all Levites. Yes. The priests are from Levi's order. Um, yes. Anybody else? All right. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You going to dismiss us, Pastor, or you want me to pray? Uh, I don't think we have any.